Hi, welcome to God's Stories today. My name's Chris Thompson. You guys coming? Welcome to God Stories Today. I'm in Ellsbury, a place that I've never actually been to before. Uh, I travelled through the wee small hours to get here from where I live and I am, well, really, really grateful for the opportunity because my uh, guest today is Nicola Neal. She is a regional coordinator for New Wine, which is a hugely responsible job, and I've had an insight into her story already and Nicola, it is it seriously you're in for a treat it is remarkable it, it, god's moved in her life in remarkable ways to the point where as we were saying beforehand it's kind of like really you want me to do what and and there's so many stories that i just can't wait to get into I, i've had an insert as i said but i've not heard the the details so it's going to be a treat before i do though before we journey together Nicola and i and you uh, may i um encourage you to subscribe to the channel by subscribing you are supporting um, this channel is not about any of us it's about God and bringing people into relationship with him so in subscribing you are supporting that uh, and do check us out on social media as well just look for God's Story Today on Instagram Facebook and Twitter and hopefully um, our first annual conference is going to be towards autumn 2021 so keep an eye out for that as well so yeah Nicola it's really good to be I'm just going to shift my body language over here like that <laughs> it's really good to be here and, and to have your company and I can't wait to hear your God story we normally start off a snapshot with where the person is right now okay. and then we go back to the very very beginning okay so so who are you and what are you right now um, so I'm currently the CEO of a charity called Every Life International, mm -hmm. and uh, we have various mission spaces in East Africa, in Uganda, Kenya, and we're just starting in Rwanda. Um, and I, I'm based now in the UK, I used to live there, but I'm based now in the UK overseeing that and being the kind of ambassador for all that we do and the fundraiser and all of those things, as well as I do a lot of speaking at conferences and things on God's heart for the poor and, and issues of justice. And I'm, on, I'm part of the leadership of New Wine. So not much then? No. And then just breeze through the day with not much to do <laughs> <Yeah>. at all. <laughs> wow, that's hugely responsible. So, so and, and again, this is why I'm really grateful for Nicola's time. She's a busy woman. But let's go right back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Where were you born? This is your God story. So where were you born? I was born just down the road from here in Amersham. Were you really? Yeah. So what were you like as a child then? As a child, um, very shy, mm. actually. Yeah, quite quiet, quite shy. Uh, I had, my mum always says that I had a deep love for Jesus from when I was really, really little from about five years old. So oh. my first question in the playground or on the beach was, hi, my name's Nicola, do you know Jesus? Um, and I, I kind of remember that a little bit, but yeah, as a child, I was very comfortable being at home, mm -hmm. never really liked to go out and do anything too different, very shy, very quiet, quite different to who I am today. <laughs> <laughs> so it's clearly Jesus, God featured yeah. big time in your early life. Yes. Was that because of your parents? Was it, was it just one of those things that like Jesus just was in your heart from the outset? I think it was because of my parents. I grew up in the house church movement and uh, so I had people literally living next door who really loved Jesus, my parents who really loved Jesus. We were always in and out of each other's homes, right. having meals together, praying, worshipping. As a child, that's just the environment that I grew up in, wow. which is very special actually. Mm. So God was present in all that we did really as a family which has had a huge impact on my life. So were there any significant people along the way, like from, from zero to 16, should we say, or let's say 18, significant people or significant God moments along the way where things really, really deepened? Yeah, I mean, we live next door <clears throat> but one to um, an amazing man called Frank and uh, Uncle Frank to me. Everyone was un uncle and auntie. Frank's a great name, isn't it? Isn't it? Frank, good Frank. <laughs> 
Go on, Frank. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he, was, he was amazing. He led my parents to Jesus and he also kind of led the house church that we were part of. And, and he has been probably one of the, the biggest influences in my life, if I'm honest. And I can remember being very little and, and walking between my house and his house and going upstairs and sitting on his desk and asking him questions about who Jesus was. And I remember coming home one day after being talking with him and walked into the kitchen. My mum was cooking dinner and saying, Mum, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And her praying for me and having an encounter with God at seven in the kitchen. He baptised me when I was nine in a bath upstairs in, in somebody's house. And um, I interned for him when I was 18. He was wow. leading the church grew and it sort of outgrew a house and it became a huge church congregation. I interned with him when I was 18 and he mm. began me in my kind of ministry journey. He married me to my husband. He dedicated my children, you know, so he's been an amazing influence in my life. And uh, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for all that he taught me about Jesus, about love, about what it is to actually lay your life down and follow Jesus. So, yeah. A couple of questions on that, if I may. Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to get on to your bullet points, yeah. which are remarkable. Um, you said you had an encounter with God. I think you said age seven. seven yeah. And I think you said in the kitchen or something like yeah. that. What happened? My, I can remember it as clear as anything. My mum was at the oven and she was stirring, cooking dinner, you know, stirring something on the stove. And I had just walked in and said, Mum, I want to properly give my life to Jesus and I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I think she was a bit taken aback by that. It wasn't what she was expecting. And so she just said, OK. And she took me into the front room and sat with me and I prayed with her. And that was the first time that I really physically experienced that sort of presence and power of God just surging through me. I remember it very, very vividly. OK, so in October 2000, there was a period of three months where encounters began, which is how Nicola sort of wrote it here. And it says, God broke our hearts for the poor. Mm. Speak about that. What was going on? What are these encounters? What was going on? Um, so it all started by, I was, we were part of a church in Bath. My husband was, when we first got married, my husband was still a student in Bath. Oh, and okay. so I moved to Bath and we ended up staying there. We were part of a church there and we, it was a conference based church. And there was a huge conference happening and I was there and I was stood right at the side. And at this point in my life, I'm still a fairly shy, quiet, mm -hmm. reserved person, just want a nice, quiet little life hidden away somewhere. And, um, and I wanted to have lots of babies. That's what I was going to do and be home full time. I, you know, I just was, that was me. And I had a very clear plan for my life. I mean, I had it written out, detailed really? out. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it was for us to marry someone like Simon who would be able to earn enough money so that I didn't have to work because I didn't want to have to engage with the world. I was very frightened of the world. Um, to have a house somewhere out in the countryside where I could grow a lot of our own food. I would just raise children and hide away mm. in my own little kind of corner of England. And I was at this conference and uh, the, the preacher was talking and there was, at the end there was a ministry call about surrender. And the, the, the person was saying, I feel there's somebody here who has a, has a very detailed plan that they've written for their life. <laughs> but the Lord is saying to you, your plan is not my plan. Will you surrender it? And it's one of those moments when your heart starts pounding, oh, yes. you're like, oh dear. This is me, and I stood for ages, just thinking, I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I, my plan is become, so, it's my safety, yeah. and I didn't know what to do. But, but I just, I just love Jesus. Mm. I've always loved Jesus, so I'm like, I know that he, I know I can trust him. So I was in this kind of wrestling moment. Anyway, to cut a long story short, today I walked to the front and I got down on my knees, and I stayed there for two hours just wrestling with the Lord of just letting my plans go. And in the end, I was able to just say, I surrender them all to you. It's okay. You can take them. And I, and I, I do trust you, Jesus. So it took two hours. Yeah. Which I've got to be honest, is actually not a long, a long time to let go. When you think about it, you've had these plans for all your life. Yeah. Um, and you've written them down. They are vital to who you are. Yeah. But within two hours, yeah. Of rest, you, you've laid them down to Jesus yeah. and said, okay, your path is the one I'll take. That's really brave and quite remarkable. It, it was very remarkable considering my kind of makeup at that time. 
Um, I think two hours seemed like a really long time for the guy who was waiting to lock the <laughs> building up. <laughs> because when I kind of came out, you know what it's like, you're so intense in this mm. moment with Jesus. And when it was all done, and I opened my eyes, I was the last person by my husband in the building and the guy with the lights and the keys was just sort of waiting patiently to close the whole thing down. But um, yeah, in some ways it was quick. But I think all of, all of my life I'd been growing this relationship mm. where I knew his voice, mm. I recognised his voice, and I, and I just had this deep sense of trust mm. that he loved me. And I think Uncle Frank had taught me about unconditional love. He really had. He lived that mm. out. He demonstrated that to me in such an incredible way and reflected, you know, who Father God was. That I just, that was always a done deal for me. And so in the end, it was like, well, if, if that's what you're asking, mm. then it must be for my good. And you are good. So it's okay. Mm. So how did it yeah. feel when you actually did say, okay, your plans were Oh, I mean, I wailed into the floor because it felt very vulnerable. Mm. It did feel very scary, mm. but, um, but also strangely liberating mm. and mm. exciting. Mm. Yeah. Be encouraged. Yeah. But you said he broke your heart for the poor. Yeah. At that point? Over that, over that period, yeah. Um, if, we, if we jump to, to the Christmas of that year... We had, my whole family came for Christmas and we only had a little house. So my husband and I were sleeping on the kitchen floor and my son was one year old. And, um, and I had a dream that night. Uh -huh. And in the dream, I, I was a small child and I was living in what I understand now, I didn't know at the time, to be a slum house. And I was very poor, I had raggy clothes and no shoes. And... I was in this house and there was a woman there who had a huge metal pole in her hand. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I was the same child, but I was standing in a huge toy department store. And my brother had hold of my hand and he was saying to me, we must buy you a Buzz Lightyear. You need to have a Buzz Lightyear. We must get you a Buzz Lightyear. That was like the toy of, yeah. you know, that Christmas. Yeah. My son had one. And so he's dra dragging me around the shop. We've got to find you a Buzz Lightyear. And I kept saying to him, I don't need a Buzz Lightyear. And that was bizarre. And then suddenly I was back in this slum house and there was my mother... I knew she was my mother, it wasn't actually my mother, but I knew this woman represented my mother and she had this metal pole and she lifted it up and she began to beat me. And oh, wow. I knew in that moment that if I didn't get out, she was going to beat me and I was going to die. So I jumped up and I started to run through these tiny little kind of bendy passageways and alleyways, which I'd never seen before, but again, now I recognise them as slum alleyways. And I'm running and I'm running and I can hear her coming behind me. And... And I knew that if I didn't escape, I was, she was going to kill me. And suddenly I had this shooting pain coming up my feet. So much pain that it caused me to stumble. And I fell over onto the ground. And I turned my foot over. And I saw what looked like maggots and worms coming out of the bottom of my feet. Wow. And I heard her footsteps coming and I just shouted out loud, I didn't need a Buzz Lightyear. I just needed a pair of shoes. And I woke up. And I woke up crying and it was Christmas morning and I didn't know what to do with myself. I'd bought my son a Buzz Lightyear for Christmas. The whole family were there. I had to do the turkey and for the whole day I just kind of got through it. But I felt very stirred inside like I knew God was trying to speak to me. The whole family stayed for a couple of days and then after they'd left I sat with my husband and said to him, I had this dream and, and I really believe it's from the Lord and... And I began to talk and, and share it with him. He's like, well, okay, well, we'll just invite God to come and, and continue to speak if he's trying to get our attention. Still, that's fine. The next night we were watching a film. It was a, it was a ridiculous film, but it was about a small child who was um, in an abusive situation. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the film, I just began to cry. I, could, I couldn't understand why I was crying but I couldn't stop the tears. Mm -hmm. I was just crying and crying and crying. And I think Simon thought he'd done something to upset me. Mm -hmm. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm so, I'm so um, moved by this story of this small child and who'd grown up in poverty. And, and I ended up falling out of the chair and just lying on the floor, just crying and crying. And my husband, who is, I mean, he's a physicist by training. He's a scientist by training. He's a very non-emotional person, very kind of pragmatic. He then 
suddenly started to cry as well and ended up laying face down on the floor next to me and we just sobbed into the carpet. And I was so surprised by that. And the presence of God just started to descend. And, um, and I thought, something's happening here. And mm. we were there till 3 a.m., really? just crying and crying and saying, Jesus, here we are, here yeah. we are. Yeah. I don't know what it is you're doing, but it felt like our hearts were being broken that night, but we weren't sure what they were being broken for. Um, and then we got up the next morning, we kind of dragged ourselves to bed, you know, and the next morning, my, my son, who was one, woke up and we got up, you know how you do, and went into the kitchen and Simon put the kettle on and then we stood in the kitchen and then the presence of God just came and we just began to cry. We cried through the whole day on and off. Put our son to bed, woke up the next morning, the same thing happened. And it just continued to happen. My husband was working in IT and he would go to the office and and he would explain it like I'm sat at my desk and he was doing coding, whatever it's called, I don't know, doing something on a computer. And he said, I would feel the presence of God come and think I'm going to start to weep. And he would get up and go to the bathroom and sit in the bathroom stool, you know, and just and just weep. And I was having these moments where I was walking with my son or, you know, taking him to the zoo or going into the shops with my friends. And then I'd shared it with a couple of friends what was happening and I'd say to them, oh, I'm going to cry and they go just go with it mm. and I had times when I was walking through the city of Bath where I just sat down in a corner by a shop and just put my head in my hands and would just cry it was like we were in pain like our hearts were deeply broken and we were grieving but we weren't really sure what on earth for and we began to think are we going a bit crazy mm. like is this okay um, and so I, I used to pray through the night one night a week with a friend a mentor and I went over to her house and one evening, a few weeks later, and began to share with her what, what it was that was happening to Simon and I. And um, I said to her, what do you think the Lord is doing? I, I feel like he's breaking my heart for something, but I don't know what it is. And she said, I think you should go home. It's about 2 a.m. and get your journal out and say, what is it you're breaking my heart for? So I did. I, got, I just went straight home and I've still got the piece of paper now. It's very special to me. And I just prayed, Lord, what is it that you're breaking our hearts for? And the first line I wrote down was, as a mother's heart aches and groans as she holds her dying children in her arms, saying, will someone save them? Will someone help? Such is my heart for my children in poverty around the world. And he went on to talk about his heart for the poor and for children living in you know, really deprived situations. And then at the end of it was, will you give your life to help rescue their lives? And, um, and I woke Simon up and I said, this is what I believe the Lord has said. And this is what I believe he's asking. Will you give your life? Will to you rescue? give your life to help rescue the lives of these children and around the world? And we just sat there and we're like, it's, it's a no brainer. Our hearts are already broken. Our lives are already surrendered. We're like, yes, Lord, we'll give you. We give you our lives, the rest of our lives. And that's when he spoke and said, then I require three things from you. Number one, I want you to give up all full-time work. My husband was a full-time IT, had a really good salary. You need to give up your work and give the rest of your lives to trusting me for your income and serving the poor. Number two, I want you to stop. We were, we were about to try and get pregnant for our second baby. And I want you to not to have any more natural children, but I want you to adopt a child as a prophetic sign for what I'm going to do with a whole generation of taking them out of a place of darkness and into a place of light and out of a place of orphanhood and into a place of sonship, out of a place of hopelessness and into a place of hope. Her life will be a prophetic sign. And number three, Africa. And uh, just, you know, Africa. And so we wrote that down and we weighed it with our spiritual parents and our mentors and, and so began the rest of our lives. <laughs> Nicola, that was incredible. Thank you so much for that. So, I mean, I'm, words fail me now, but, but I want to sort of highlight the fact that you reached a point where God was saying to you, I actually want your life. Mm. Will you literally give up your life mm. to save these people? Yeah. Um, and even though that possibly wasn't going to maybe or maybe lead to your your death, as it were, your non-life mm. giving up, 
you know, your, your, your direction, in some sense, your hopes, your dreams and saying, yeah. okay, everything now is reorientated to this new yeah. vision that God has given you. Yeah. And the clarity of the vision that he said, you know, he gave you subsequently as well. Those three things, give up secular work, terrifying. Yeah. Oh, it was. It was terrifying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Terrifying. Um, and also, I mean, it, it feels, I mean, biblical level, like don't have any more natural children, biographical, biographical, biological children, yeah. but, but adopt one. Yeah. And, and not only love that child, but that's going to be a prophetic sign of yeah. what I'm going to call you to do for the rest of your lives. Yeah. And then the last one, it's Africa. Boom. I mean, the clarity of that is astonishing. Can you remember how you got, I mean, obviously you guys, you, 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 you wept as you say, but can you remember the, what, what that was like, the enormity of that at the time? I mean, wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I remember feeling the enormity of it and thinking this isn't small. This is going to cost us everything and is going to be unpredictable. Can I just ask one question before we do go to Africa? What a great sentence. Um, <laughs> what's it like for God to speak to you? Uh, I feel like God speaks to me in many different ways. Often it's like a, a, just a small, quiet voice in, inside of my head. Sometimes uh -huh. it's through a, a feeling or a sense that I have. Very, very, very occasionally I've had an external audible voice. Um, but you have. You've heard his voice. Uh, twice, voice. yeah. Um, and, and, and often through dreams at night you know he will speak to me through my dreams sometimes i think he speaks to me when i'm asleep because i talk a lot <laughs> any time you can actually get a word in edgeways so um yeah so different ways i guess okay i love the fact though that you he speaks to you in a variety of ways because yeah. I, I just think that's great and also when i think about our varying personalities i love the fact that god is able to use our personalities to speak yeah. to us accordingly but equally, it comes to mind to say also, I love the fact that you've been on such a journey that you went from being someone who had her life mapped out on a piece of paper, mm. was quite re uh, uh, shy and retiring, wanted to live in a house in, in the middle of nowhere so you could literally just shut the world out, grow your own vegetables, have a husband who was bringing in you, the wages as it were, yeah. and here you are. <laughs> you've <laughs> given up your sort of like direction, you've given yeah. up your life, you've given up secular paid employment, you're, you're running a church and you're waiting to go to Africa. Yeah. Yeah, and it's probably really important to say on that actually that we had a couple in the church who were the senior, some of the senior leaders in that church who gave their lives to Simon and I in mentoring us and training us and discipling us and calling out the good stuff mm. in us, but also calling out the rubbish oh, and going, right. that's hey, that's, there's, that's a fear-based decision you're making there, or that was fear speaking there, or that was something, let's deal with that. And I think if it hadn't been for that couple mm. who walked so closely with us over all of those years um, and, and helped me, particularly as a person, process my fear and my anxiety and the things that would have held me back from making some really ridiculous decisions for Jesus, I don't know that I would have been able to make them. And so um, I, I owe a lot to that couple mm -hmm. who walked with us and, and discipled us in every way, in our marriage, in our parenting, in our spiritual life, in our ministry, in our leadership, in who we were as people. Gosh, it's so important to have those people in our it's lives so and to do important. life with people. Yeah. You know, church is not just a Sunday thing, it's doing life with people. And really doing is. life with people and allowing them to really see all of you. Yeah, scary. You know, yeah, not <laughs> just the shiny parts. And they were, they want, they were interested in all of us. And um, oh, they, they were incredible. Yeah. Thank you to whoever you are. Um, seems like you don't want to name them, so that's fine. I won't push. <laughs> Africa, 2008. Yeah. What happened? How did it suddenly come upon <laughs> you after all those years? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, how sometimes you wrestle with these prophetic words over your life and then you think, well, whatever, I give up. It's never going to happen. You let it go and then suddenly it all takes off, which is pretty much what happened for us. It began in September 2008. I was speaking at a conference um, and it was a huge conference, about 2,000 people, and I could see someone at the back, and I thought, I know that person. I'm sure I know them, couldn't place them. And at the end, she came up to me and, and was like, are you Nikki Thomas, which was my maiden name? I'm like, oh my goodness, yes, and realized that we'd grown up in the house church together, but hadn't seen each other at that point for 30 years. So we're having this quite emotional little reunion, and then all of a sudden, she stops dead in her tracks and goes, why are you in England? Huh? You're supposed to be in Africa. No, you're supposed to be in Uganda. How did she and know? then she went, oh, why did I just say that? And I'm like, I don't know. 
but I really want to go to Africa. And that kick started really three months of receiving just extraordinary prophetic words. I, I went and met a lady who had been, someone said, you're really, you need to go and connect with this woman. You'd get on really, really well. And so we, we messaged and met for a coffee in a motorway service station. And, and we kind of sat there and she'd bought her laptop. I'm like, oh, you bought your laptop. And she's like, I really felt Jesus tell me to show you some pictures of some kids we work with in Kenya. And she opened it up and there was an image of a child with its foot turned over with little worms coming out of its foot. Yeah. And I just broke down and I'm like, oh my goodness. And she said to me, this is having real impact on you. And I'm there. Yeah. And then she just started to prophesy about Africa. And, and it just went on like that. We just had words sent to us from all over the world, actually, over 30 of them for over that sort of September through to sort of early December of 2008. And um, it was overwhelming in the end. Really? It was like Africa, Africa, Africa. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I collated them all. And we went to meet with the guy who we were leading the church with. By this point, my husband, myself and this guy were kind of the senior leaders of this church and went to meet with him and, and said to him, this is what the Lord has been saying. <laughs> Seems like we're supposed to go to Africa. We'd never been to Africa. I had no idea what Africa was like. You know, I just not got a clue. So we said to him, would you be all right if we went for a couple of weeks on some kind of missions trip, you know? <laughs> And uh, he sat there and he's looking and he's nodding. And then he just said to us, you'll learn nothing in two weeks. Oh. This is undeniably Jesus, but you'll learn nothing in two weeks. I think you should just move there. At which point I'm like, are you mental? <laughs> like, that'd be ridiculous. I had two children then. My daughter was five. My son was nine. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a mortgage. We've got school. We're leading the church. We have lives. And, and I don't know how this was possible how we didn't know this. But then he then says, you know, I'm leaving for Uganda this afternoon. Hang, hang, on, hang on a minute. <laughs> it's so bizarre. <laughs> the leader was leading for yeah, Uganda. Yeah, and I, I, he must have told us and we'd forgotten or something, I don't know. But he was just going for a few days to do something and, and we were involved, our church had been involved with an NGO there. And um, he's like, oh, but I'm leaving and for Heathrow in an hour. And we're like, what? Uh, but I was thinking, oh, Uganda, this is what this girl had said to me, right? Because um, Africa's a big place. And he said, so that's how long you've got. And we're like, that's how long we've got for what? He said, to make your decision. If you're up for just moving there, when I arrive tomorrow morning, I'll find you a house. <laughs> so I, I, by this point, you know, I've had quite a lot of healing in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm a bit more confident than I used to be. I'm a bit more spontaneous. I'm the more prophetic -y one in our marriage. But even I was like... <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah. But I thought I'd be okay because my very processed, you know, husband who takes 10 years to decide to buy a television was never going to... was just never going to decide to do that. But we said it very obediently, okay, well, we'll go have a coffee. So we went to Starbucks. And we didn't speak the whole way there. Stunned. We, yeah. We ordered our coffee and we sat down. And I'm looking at my husband, who's just silent, you know. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. And after about 30 minutes of absolute silence, I remember it. He just put his cup down. He looked me straight in the eye and he said, baby, this is Jesus. We need to move. Yeah, and it was about eight, ten weeks later that we moved. What were you drinking? No, sorry. <laughs> I'm not having that cup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was quite a coffee. No lattes at Starbucks ever again. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was... So three months later, you moved to Uganda? Yes. And so the leader had found you a house. It all got yeah, sort of somehow worked out. Yeah, so he got out. us a house and, um, and we... We left on the 1st of March, so it was about two and a half months, but about eight to ten weeks, yeah, between that conversation and when we flew, and, um, and it was crazy. Can I, can I ask you, the, the, the very morning of, of getting in the car, or however it is you, try, you, you got to the airport, yeah, and you got on that plane, <laughs> yeah. what was that like? Oh, it was horrible. Um, well, all of our families wanted to come to the airport to say goodbye mm. because none of us knew when we would be seeing each other again, really. And we didn't really know what we were flying into. And I, I had this little thing. as like, will I ever get to come back? Do you know what I mean? It was really a big thing. And, and um, 
I had said to all the family, I can't deal with lots of emotion at the airport because I think it's going to be quite stressful. But they all promised that they wouldn't cry. But of course, they rock up grannies and granddads and it's just emotional carnage everywhere. And it was really, it was very emotional. Mm -hmm. And hugging them and saying goodbye. My children were so little and, and had no idea. I mean, my son had this little <laughs> safari hat on and kind of was, I'm going to find the crocodiles, granny. And that was his understanding of what we were about to do. My daughter... She hadn't got a clue. I mean, she was five and completely clueless. I always say to people, Afra could have been like Tesco. She wouldn't have known the difference, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. She just thought she was going on a, an adventure and, and she's just all wide-eyed. And after they'd all left and we'd gone through security and we got to our gate, it, I think it was when I sat there and I saw the plane mm -hmm. that I was about to put my children on that the enormity of this decision hit me really of like oh my goodness what are we doing and in that three month period had you done a scouting trip to sort of see what it was going to be like we or? had packed up six suitcases and got on a plane just simon and i because we thought maybe we should go and see it for the first time without our children so we'd kind of flown into uganda <laughs> which is quite an experience been taken to the house, dumped our suitcases and, and spent a couple of days looking around and quickly put some toys and things out in the two bedrooms that would be the children's right, right. so they would see something familiar. Had a quick kind of tour of the city really, but we're only there for a few days and then came back again. So it was a tiny taster. And yeah. how did that leave your heart? Did it make you feel even more daunted or more... more your appetite was was increased for it. We fell in love. Oh. We absolutely fell in love. We 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 got off of the plane at the time in Entebbe. You would come onto the tarmac outside, and I remember walking down, feeling so so nervous and apprehensive, mm. and walking down the steps and standing on the ground in Uganda. And I turned to my husband, and he just had tears, and he said, "We've just come home." Yeah. Isn't it amazing how God can give it you a heart amazing. for something? That you can almost, well, you can't describe it as home. Yeah, it, it was amazing. And it was helpful that we'd had that moment because then we got in the car and went into the Kampala traffic. Oh, right. I mean, it was is that, is that absolutely bad? <laughs> bonkers. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm glad we had that moment, you know, a couple of hours ago because it's a crazy city, a beautiful, vibrant, noisy, chaotic, very, very alive, but um, also quite intimidating. But yeah, we fell in love and and we couldn't wait to get back then. Really? That was helpful. So when you actually landed and you had your children with you. Yeah. And then and you arrived at the house for the second time. Yeah. And you opened the door. What was that like? Very sobering. Yeah. Very sobering. And we just, someone met us at the airport with a sign with our names on. And um, the NGO that our church had been linked with were very, very kind and had sort of arranged for a pickup for us and they dropped us at the house and just gave us the keys and we're in this massive compounded, you know, sick 12 foot walls and razor wire and gates and padlocks and dogs and um and unpacking and the kids are kind of like, what's going on? And the heat and the smell and the noise. It, it was just very, very overwhelming. And I remember that evening we had a power cut, which of course became everyday life. But I'd never seen any, I'd never been anywhere where the lights were off and it was so dark. Mm. There's just no ambient light anywhere. And the whole city went out. You couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. And I remember sitting there thinking, I have brought my small children here. Wow. And I'm sat in this compound in the middle of a village and I don't know if we're okay, and yeah. I don't know where to find a candle, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> and just thinking, I really hope this is Jesus. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. we're in some serious trouble. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I feel like I'm there. I hope yeah. you guys do. It's amazing, isn't it? I feel like I'm literally there with you. Yeah. So so there you are. You've arrived. You, yeah. You've had your first power cut. You've yeah. really been introduced very, very quickly into life in Uganda, and yet you, you felt this blessing from God that it was home, yeah. which I find incredible, yeah. absolutely incredible. So what happened then? Because in here you talk about, um, well, actually, you arrived in March and then in May you walked into your first slum yeah. experience. What Could you talk about that? Yeah, so the first couple of months was really us. We had no one to show us how to do life. 
to teach us anything. So really, actually, there was one lady in the village who was very kind to us, but just it was we were just working out how on earth do you live when the electricity is constantly off, we've got no running water, and how do you shop when you don't speak the language and la 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 put our kids in the local African village school and you know that sort of stuff and mm. then began to meet people in the village and I became friends with a lovely young man called Amos and one day we were out for a walk around the village I mean we did we had nothing we didn't know what we were there to do because oh. when when the Lord said move in that kind of eight ten weeks before we actually moved to Africa every time we would pray and say well what are you sending us there to do so hold the phone. Actually, I hadn't clocked that. You'd gone yeah. with that not knowing why. So we went with no team, no money, no vision, no resources. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really awkward when you have to tell your whole church that you're leaving. We're moving, we're leaving. And there was an audible gasp, you know, and what are you going to do? We've got absolutely no oh, idea. Oh, Nick, a big respect. Yeah, and our parents, you know, we're moving, we're taking your grandchildren, we're moving to Africa. What are you going to do? We don't know. The Lord hasn't told us. Because every time he would pray, he would just say, when you get there, I'll show you. You guys remind me of Philip in the Bible. You know, the Spirit just like, scooped him up and off and, he went. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but go on. Yeah, no, on. but it's true. And so... When you're trying to fundraise, <laughs> to sponsor yourself, to go on mission, to do something that you've got no idea, people are like, well, what are we giving money to? Like, <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. We just knew we had a word from the Lord. And so when we actually, those first few months of being there, we didn't know what to do. And so we just would pray. That's what we do. We spent every morning praying and worshipping and every afternoon walking around the local area, just trying to interact with people and get to know people, set our kids in school. And I'd met this guy, Amos, and we were on one of our afternoon walks and I met this little child and we were talking and, and I was so profoundly moved by her story. And as she went home, I, I, there were tears in my eyes and Amos turned to me and said, oh, you're a nightmare, Nicola. You're crying over this story. You'd never survive in a slum. And I was, I mean, this is embarrassing to admit, but I was so naive. Mm. And I said to him, there's no slums in Africa. And he's like, there's one less than a five minute walk from your front door. Mm. So I was just, I was so shocked. And, and I said to him, then take me there. And he what, said, there and then? yeah, like, take me there, let's go. And he said, no, you don't understand. It's, it's way too dangerous for you to go in there. Um, you know, I'm going to stand out like a sore thumb for a start. And it's, too, it's not safe. It's too dangerous for you. And I just said to him, I don't care. Take mm. me there. And he said, no, you don't understand. And I said, and I remember saying to him, no, you don't understand. I, I need you to take me there. And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to go and get someone from the, the, the L switch, like the local um, council that cares for the area to get their permission to let them know that I'm taking you in. Mm -hmm. So you've got a night to think about it. And if you really want to go tomorrow, I'll take you. So the next day, my husband and I and a young guy, Johnny, who'd moved with us, he's a great young guy, came with us as an intern, really. And um, he, was, he was a brilliant young man. We went. And for me walking into that slum was was a life-changing moment mm. and it's hard to describe i mean i'd just never seen that level of poverty face to face before mm. and and it felt like in a moment like the face of the child behind the oxfam advert or the people that you would read about in a bbc news documentary or something or article or whatever was no longer this slightly distanced statistic mm. or story but it was like a living breathing tangible person who was just there looking me straight in the eye and mm. and it was overwhelming and slums if you've been there they're chaotic places they're loud they're chaotic they are disease filled there's raw sewage flowing through the street there is chaos everywhere disease addiction prostitution i mean it's all there mm -hmm. it's quite toxic it's a toxic mix and i remember just standing in the midst of it all just like i i'm overwhelmed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm overwhelmed and and i heard the lord speak very clearly and he said this is where i've called you to love and serve and i remember standing there 
and just I, mean, I, I wanted to say that kind of letter me to me according to your will. You know what I mean? I wanted to have that kind of response, but I was just like, Jesus, I, I can't do that. Mm. I, I, I don't. I, I have nothing in my hands. Mm. I have no training. I have no experience to draw on. I have no degree in development. I have mm. nothing. I have no money. We have nothing to make any kind of a difference to a situation as complex as this one. And I remember him saying, but you have me. And so that began our journey. Yeah, it was, it was, we went home that day and I, we just wept. We wept. Mm. Like I didn't know. Mm. I get sense that I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know that people lived like that. Mm. I mean, I did, but I didn't. Mm. But I've seen, I've seen it now, and so it, it, it demanded a response. You can't, you can't stand physically somewhere like that and not do something. And one month later, it would seem, according to your notes, that he gave you a strategy yeah. for the transformation of the slums. Now, something's popped into my head <laughs> that I'm just going to quickly ask you now, and if it's, yeah. a, if it's nothing, we'll just move on. Okay. But in your original vision that you said when you had a dream yeah. and you were running through... you. You, you were in this, what we now, I'd say, is a slum, and then you were in a toy store, and it was a Buzz Lightyear, and then you went back to, and you ran off, and this woman was chasing you, yeah. and she had a pole. What did, who was the woman and the pole? And specifically, what did the pole represent? I think it represented abuse and oppression. Okay. Yeah. And, um, I mean, that day, actually, interestingly, when I was in that slum, I said, Simon, this is what I saw all really? those years ago. Okay. Now I understand it was a slum. Um, and but I feel like that was like it was oppression that was just killing people, it was beating the life out of people and stealing life. I thought so. I just I just yeah. felt like I needed to ask that. But thank you for the clarification. So he gave you one month later yeah. his strategy for the transformation. Yeah, I mean we were overwhelmed and and didn't know where to begin. What do you do? Yeah. What I mean? What do you do? And um, and one morning I woke up a few weeks later and, and I heard the Lord speak to me as I was waking up saying, today I'm going to give you this strategy for transformation for that community. And I'm, I'm a visionary, if you haven't worked that out, and um, I'm a visionary strategist. So I love to have a, a, a vision and then I love to work out how, you know, a strategy, uh -huh. I live and breathe strategy. And so I was really excited. I jumped out of bed. I woke up Simon and Jonathan, the young guy who was there with us and like, God's going to give us the strategy today. And, and I got all the paper we had and stuck it on the wall. Mm. you know and gathered all my pens and highlighters thinking we we're going to do some kind of amazing you know mapping type experience and I remember we sat there and and then we prayed and I said okay Lord give me the download and um and this is what he said your strategy is to love them <laughs> and I remember going and, <laughs> you know, and more. <laughs> that's it your strategy is to love them whatever love looks like in that moment, to the one in front of you, do that, and really? I'll work out the rest. Yeah. So, so in my head, I'm thinking you're like you're a presence. You're in the slum. You're even walking amongst the people, as it were. But the, every time you meet someone, it's whatever it looks like to love yeah. that person is the strategy. And it's not difficult to work out what love looks like in a slum. Do you know what I mean? To mm. a mum who's just losing it because her baby is screaming, it's picking up the baby and caring for the baby. To someone who's sick. It's giving the medicine to someone who's hungry. It's trying to get them some food. It's, you know, it, was, it wasn't difficult to work it out in a sense. Um, and so we just, we just began to go to that community. We did it for six months every day, all day, and just be with the people and love them and support them and care for them and listen to them. Mm. I mean, a lot of them have fled war zones and conflict zones and have very traumatic stories that nobody's ever heard and just to sit there and say I care about you and I care about the story of your life and listening to their stories whilst peeling them a toki and helping them create food for their families you know or helping to clean their houses there's a huge HIV infection rate and a lot of people who are very sick and who can't bathe themselves and so you bathe them you know, that's what you do. and You bathe the people. Yeah, you help them wash and you help them dress and you just, you just be one with the people. Mm, mm. And so that's, that's what we did. And then it was interesting you brought up the dream because a couple of months into doing that, 
we had no money, as I said, we had no resources, nothing. And I was going to ask, how did you sort of make all this happen? In yeah, terms we of just, we just, anything we had at home, anything we had in our own bank account from the support that we had from our church and other people, we used. Um, and then someone ran a marathon for us in the UK and raised £150. And we were like, whoa, this is amazing. You know, what What do you want us to do with this money, Jesus? And and he said, I want you to buy a pair of shoes for every child in the community. And isn't that incredible? And it, it straight away took me back to that dream of I didn't need a Buzz Lightyear. I just needed a pair of shoes. So we did. And we bought shoes and you could buy a pair of shoes for 50p. So we bought 300 pairs of shoes and 300 little feet had shoes to wear, which is helpful. And and so things began to grow out of that. And, you know, we learned lessons very quickly of when helping hurts and aid versus aid and relief versus development and which one is right when and how you actually empower people to be their own makers of change. And we went on that whole journey and our ministry has changed and grown over the years. But um, but we still all the time say to our teams around the world, it, it, go go live out love today. That's so in, what we do. So in those early days then, especially those, that six month period, what, what were the God moments? I'm sure there were many as it were. Oh, but... so many. I mean, so many. You know, you you go in and you have, like I said, you have nothing really except Jesus and the pennies in your pocket. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you had we had so many encounters with people where, you know, there's someone who's sick and they're like, can you help us get to the doctors? And you're like, I literally have nothing in my bank. I have nothing. I, I can't, but I can pray. Mm-hmm. Let's pray. And, and then Jesus would come and he would heal that person. Or a mama would say to us, I only have three, I don't know, three pieces of matoki, but I have to feed 12. And you're like, well, let's pray over the food. And suddenly it was just enough. And, you know, you have these little moments all the way through where you're seeing the miraculous break in just in small ways in the, in the everyday moments. Or someone is dying, but you sit there and, and you hold their hand and they're not alone. And and you're just with them and the presence of God is there. As they die. As they die. And and what is a moment that's actually, and the relatives, a moment that is filled with pain, it's also filled with comfort mm. and love and that, that deep sense of the presence of Jesus. And so it was just seeing him coming and meeting them, you know, in, in little ways. And I learned a lot. Okay, there's some seismic things you've you've mentioned there and hinted at as well. You talked about um, praying for people and they were healed. And you mm. talked about there not being enough food and you prayed and there was enough. And, yeah. and please, being with people as they die, you know, if you're willing to talk about those moments, that would be incredible. Yeah. But a free reign now, you know, okay. just, just, just talk about some of the stories, talk about some of the healings, talk about... I mean, it sounds like the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, you know, and you know yeah. that you're referring to, and that's sort of just like free reign now. Just go for it. Talk to us about. Well, that's of... a brilliant story. It's one of my one of my favourite stories of ours. Where's it? There have a couple. That the multiplication of food. The first time we saw that actually happen. There's more than one. Yeah, <laughs> but the first time we saw that happen was really quite incredible. So, one of my staff had come to me and said, "I think we should throw a banquet." for all the people who live in this particular slum community at that time we were in four and um and we should invite the whole community to come and we'll just have a huge feast for free and celebrate christmas and i'm like that's a beautiful idea let's have a party so we invited all of the people who lived in those communities to come with a little ticket you know and again, we didn't have much. So all of my team were emptying out their pockets. And most of my team were just Ugandans I'd met through the local church and things. They didn't have a lot. We didn't pay anyone any salaries because we didn't have any money. They just gave themselves to do this for Jesus. And he took care of them financially. And so we we're all emptying out our pockets. You know, we gathered a certain amount of money together and went to some women in the village. And like, is this enough money to cook some food for this number of people? And they're like, well, yes, we can if we're careful. So we're like, great. And anyway, the day of the banquet came and a guy who had a church in just outside the slum, it, it, a church is a bit of a grand word. It was really kind of corrugated iron and wood, but it was it was shade. He said, you can use my building. So we had these massive saucepans, you know, beans, rice, matoki and beef. Because What's wanted, matoki? Matoki is like, um, it's like plantain. It's a savoury banana. You okay. steam it. It's delicious. And beef because we wanted to have meat because slum dwellers, meat is a luxury. Food is a luxury, but meat is 
is you know a real luxury so we had these big saucepans and we told everyone to arrive at a certain time so they all start coming and they come into the hall and we have balloons and stuff and the kids are running around it's chaos and they come and they they get their food you know and then they go and sit down but I was watching it all play out and I knew how much food we had and I knew how many people we'd invited but word spread really quickly around all of the other communities that free food was being given out in this church hall so people started to come and I'm watching people who I knew weren't part of the community join the queue and I got really nervous because um, slum culture is very volatile and if you promise something that you don't deliver that's not a good thing to do and it can become very dangerous very quickly and I knew that we were probably in quite a lot of danger if we couldn't feed everybody and I knew we couldn't so I was about to go to like where the queue was and sort of block the door and say I'm so sorry but mm. you actually you can't come in and I heard God speak to me and he said feed everybody refuse no one <laughs> So I said, Jesus, you don't understand. <laughs> like, I don't have enough food. I, I, I can't do this. And he said, again, feed everyone, refuse no one. And so again, I said, Lord, I don't, I can't do that. I don't have enough. And then he said it a third time. And, and I've learned, as I'm sure you have over the years, that when, when God speaks three times, you listen. So I'm like, okay. So I went to where they were serving this food and I said to my team, half the portion sizes, like you need to give small portions because we're going to have double the amount of people. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, absolutely. And then just keep heaping these mountains, you know, these mountains of food. I'm like, no, stop it. Anyway, we fed everyone. And I was so surprised and I walked to the back to kind of high five my team to say, well, well done, good job. And they're like, no, Dad, you don't understand. Look inside the saucepans. And I looked inside and there were still loads of food left. So I was just confused. Yeah. I'm like, I don't understand. I'm sure we'd done our maths. So I'm like, well, that's great. So maybe we can invite everyone up for seconds. The whole place, men, women, children, the whole place come up for seconds. We delivered the seconds. I went to the back and the saucepans are still full of food. I, I, and I just didn't understand it. I was just confused, genuinely. I didn't, I didn't th even think it was a miracle. I just thought, this is weird. And so we invited people up for thirds. Nobody wanted any. So I said, I've got photographs of it. I said, well, let's pick up the saucepans then and travel. So I've got pictures of us all, these massive handles, you know, carrying these huge hot saucepans, walking out around the community going, anybody want some free food? And people came and... If they had containers, they bought their container, like a bucket or a yeah. jerry can, and we would pour it in. And if they didn't have that, then they would bring a carrier bag and we would pour the food and they'd tie it up. And we moved around this whole community area and we got to the last house and the food ran out. No. Yeah. And at that point, I was like, oh, we've just, see we've just seen a miracle. So hang on. It's kind it just... extraordinary. It's wow there's so many questions that come to mind but i just want to sort of say, what did your husband think at this time because he's because he's a physicist yeah right and, and and i mean i love astrophysics and so forth but in a very amateurish way um but he's a physicist and, yeah. and here is god yeah. in some way i'm going to i'm going to use very very bad language here but should we say manipulating sort of the laws of physics here yeah, right and chemistry yeah. and biology in some way so that the pots didn't run out of yeah. food seemingly I mean, what did he think? But equally, like, did the people who were serving up sort of think, what, did they sort of witness it? How is this not emptying? Like, what was going on there? To be honest, the, my Ugandan staff, they don't even blink when it comes to miracles. They, they just, they sort of go, well, of course. And it's, it's me and my husband who are like going, what? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Simon, he's amazing, really, because I think we've seen God do so many bizarre, extraordinary things that he just kind of laughs his way through, goes, I literally, we couldn't have, we couldn't have manipulated that. That's it. I think the amount of food compared to the amount of people we fed was so disproportionate. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was ridiculous that you just go, well, it just, it's just Jesus. So we're, <laughs> we're proposing then that God somehow miraculously produce food yeah. at the very same time it was being dished up yeah. so that what was being dished up was being replaced at the very same time. Yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? When I think of our 
mission initiatives that we have in the UK. And I can't be, I, I mean, I'm an evangelist through and through, but I'm sitting here thinking, I've heard so many times and I've seen it so many times and I've talked about it so many times that actually the more you step out for God, the more yeah. he will bless you. Yeah. And I kind of almost want to say that you are on the cutting edge of that. You are on the cutting edge of stepping out for God, evangelism, mission, all of those words almost seem too small for what you were doing. You'd given up your life mm-hmm. and there you were in a slum in Uganda and, and miracles are happening because you stepped out. And it's yeah. just so encouraging, it's astonishing. Well, I remember God saying to me at the beginning, um, Nicola, if you, if you want to learn, if you want to dwell in the land of the miraculous, first of all, you have to learn how to camp out in the land of impossibility because you're not going to see a miracle unless you have a need for one. So you need to get comfortable with living in the realm of the impossible, you know, living in impossibility in order to see my possibilities break in. You, you, otherwise, you're not going to see it. Amazing. Yeah, which is true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so we just grabbed hold of that and thought, well, okay. So but my husband and I have this phrase, and we just go, only Jesus. <laughs> Something happens, we're like, wow, well, only Jesus could do that. So, I love it. Yeah. Uh, and any healing stories? Oh, well, many. Um, I'm trying to think of um, which one to tell you. I mean, many. One of my favourites, I wasn't there for this one, but one of my team were, is that there's a little boy called Bashir and he was blind. And um, they used to go and visit the family every day and he was little and he would sort of be sat, you know, and he wouldn't respond at all. And, and But they would pray every time they went. I mean, we, we pray for everything that moves. Um, and so, and we pray all the time. And so they would just always be praying for him. And then one day, um, something rolled across the floor and the child just went like that. And the, and the mama sort of started going, <gasps> And they're like, he can see. And it was just like, it just happened. It wasn't like they'd literally had their hands on his eyes. They just, every time they would go to the home, they'd pray for healing and they wouldn't see it. But they'd come back the next day and pray. We go every day, all day, right, in the slums. And so that's what we do. And and they would just keep going. And then one day they, they prayed. And then a few minutes later, he just looked like that and his eyesight was fully restored That's amazing. yeah that was really really special and and his mama was a muslim and, and beautiful beautiful lady but obviously gave her life to jesus in response to that as you often often see don't you when the miracles start to break out so and did your level of expectancy just rise and rise and rise it's interesting a story that's just come to mind actually was we we saw the odd miracle healing miracle and then so we start our day as teams, wherever we are, whether our UK team, Kenya, Uganda, whatever, we start our day in the presence of God, one to two hours of worship and encounter every day. It's it's obligatory. If you don't come to that, don't come to work. And um, and if you don't come to that, you're not going into the community because you can't give away what you haven't first received yourself. So we receive from the Lord and then we go and we give it away fresh every day. And, um, And we were in one of those morning devotions and We'd only been there about 18 months, I think, and we'd seen a few miracles. And I felt the Lord say to me, I want you to go to this particular slum community and I want you to gather all of the sick. Go and tell all of the sick to come to this. There's one clearing, because slums are overcrowded, so you don't often find spaces, but there was a space right outside the witch doctor's compound. And he said, I want you to tell all of the sick to gather there at two o'clock, I'm coming. So I'm like, oh, I've never done anything like that in my life before. So I said to the team, you know what? I think this is what Jesus has just said. You need to spend the morning going around the community and knock on every household and say, bring the sick to this place because Jesus, the healer, is coming. <laughs> and uh, I think the Lord's going to come. And But at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I, I, I've never done anything like that in my life before. And so we rocked up there at two o'clock and I thought there would be a few people, but there was many people. And then there's like a little sewage river and there's the witch doctor's shrine and he sat there, machete in hand. You know, he's not very impressed because his job is healing mm. and he charges for it. And, and so he's watching and, and it's, a t- it's, a, it's a tenuous situation. And so we worshipped for a little while and then I just said, the team were like, what do we do? And I'm like, I don't really know. But I think, let's just all move around and say to them, we're just going to come. And we're just going to say in Jesus' name, be healed. Just pray that. I think 
as, as good as anything else and let's see what happens and so they started to move around and it was the most extraordinary thing because everybody we prayed for everybody bar one person was healed that afternoon instantly everybody from a, from a myriad of different things we saw fevers reduce instantly we saw people who couldn't put weight on their legs their legs being completely healed and then being strong we saw all sorts of twisted arms come straight. We, we just saw so many extraordinary miracles. And our team were actually more surprised than the people we were praying for. Really? Like, this is actually happening. Like, this is, this, the God is moving. And of course, that led to many salvations. And, and that then felt like it opened something up for us. It raised our faith levels mm. massively. Mm. Um, and from that point onwards, I think it gave the team a new boldness <laughs> and um, they were just praying all the time to the point when I wouldn't hear about miracle stories until days later because it was dropped in conversation as if it was a casual thing. Oh, yeah, when so-and-so, the guy who couldn't hear, when he heard last week, I'm like, what guy? <laughs> you don't tell me these stories. <laughs> so it, it just it just took off then. And um, not that we see that every day at the moment or yeah it feels like it goes in seasons you know there's a there's, there's a kind of a flow of miraculous and it seems to kind of ebb and flow and but yeah we've seen some extraordinary things and you mentioned the witch doctor and in your notes you say you saw let me get this right um a witch doctor one for jesus yeah oh, tell do us you about want the story yeah we it's, that. it's my favorite story um so my team, we had a team of guys who used to go into the slum at night. It's a dangerous time to go in, but they would go into the slum at night and um, and hang out in the bars where the addicts were and the dealers and stuff. And anyway, as they were leaving one night, a young guy comes running after them and stops them. And, and he says to them, will you pray for me? I don't believe in Jesus, but you're the people who do, aren't you? And they said, yes, we are. And he said, will you pray for me? And, and he had been having what he called night terrors, demonic visitations, he called it as well where at night these demons would come into his slum house and would, would taunt him and tell him to do terrible things to himself and other people and all of this stuff. And he's, he didn't, hadn't slept well for years and he was traumatized. Will you pray for me? So our team were like, of course you will, in the name of Jesus. We just break you know, the power of that, blah, 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 blah. And then said goodbye and went about their way. Two weeks later, bumped into him and he said, you won't, you won't believe it, but since you prayed for me, it's all stopped. Mm -hmm. None of it has, has happened again. My home is full of peace and I'm full of peace and I'm sleeping and I want to meet Jesus. So they led him to Jesus. Anyway, he then says to them, I have an auntie. <laughs> I have an auntie who suffers with a similar kind of thing. She doesn't live in the slum, but she lives in a town, which we knew the town was about 40 minutes away. Would you go and pray for her? So they're like, well, we need to go back and check with Nicola, but I'm sure that'll be okay. So they came home and I'm like, it's okay as long as I can come because I don't <laughs> want to miss out. Do you know what I mean? I want to be part of the action. So we rocked up at the slum and this young guy got in the back of the car and we headed towards the town. I didn't know that the town was also the name of the district, which is very, very, it's hundreds of miles, you know, wide. So we drive to the town and his name was Joseph and said, where now, Joseph? And he said, go left and extend, which means keep going. Mm -hmm. So we kept going. It's worth saying at this point in time, my husband was very sick in hospital in isolation in London. And I was in Africa with the children. And I'd left them at home with an intern who'd just arrived in Uganda and said, I'll be about 45 minutes because I'm popping to the town down the road to pray for someone and I'll be back. You know, padlock yourself in the house and don't open the gate. And so we're driving. I mean, we went left and extended. Anyway, we ended up driving two hours outside of this town and I'm getting more and more nervous because all I knew about this young guy was he was recently out of prison. Uh. And, um, and I'm thinking... I don't know anything about you except what your crime was and I'm now feeling pretty anxious and we're heading into the middle of nowhere um, and I don't know where I am and there's no cell phone signal anymore and my children and 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 so I'm saying to him we're nearly there we're nearly there anyway about two and a half three hours into our drive he says you have to stop the car here because we have to pass the rest of the way on foot <laughs> So I'm in my flip-flops because I thought I was going to the town and now I'm hiking through the African bush and there's snakes and, and um, following this young guy into what looks like a jungle. And, and I'm saying to him, Joseph, tell me something about your auntie. 
And then he says, wow, she's the queen ranking witch doctor for the whole of this district. People come from hundreds of miles to consult the dead through her. She was dedicated to the, to the demonic at birth. She um, has been trying to break out of witchcraft for many years. And so she bought herself a little piece of land outside her village. But every time she crosses the invisible boundary line, she's instantly paralyzed from the neck down. She can't move. And the villagers pick her up and carry her back to her shrine. Wow. And so she has to continue to practice witchcraft in order to pay the bills sort of thing. She wants to be free. So you're going to pray for her. So I, <laughs> In your flip-flops. In my flip-flops, <laughs> hiking through the bush. So I'm walking through the bush following this guy thinking... I know, where, I know where you've come from. You've just told me about your auntie. And in my mind, I've got some kind of Elijah and the Prophets of Baal kind of showdown going on in my yeah. head. And I'm thinking, I don't know if we're going to come out of this alive. Um, and then suddenly we walked through into this beautiful clearing. And there are all the little round mud houses with the thatch, you know, beautiful. And they're clearing. And I saw the other side, this old lady with grey hair, quite unusual in Uganda because the, the, their average life expectancy is much less than ours. And she saw me and I saw her and she looked at me and then she ran, which again is very unusual for an elderly lady, but she ran in culture and she threw herself at our feet and she's going blah, 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 blah. So I turned to Joseph and I went, who's this? And he said, that's my auntie. So I said, and what is she saying? said she's saying give me Jesus give me Jesus give me Jesus so I said to the guys who are with me that's too easy like that's too easy stand her up so he stands her up and I said right so we had two interns with us and one of my senior team I'm like give her the gospel but give it to her good like give her the proper gospel not the kind of slightly sanitized western version we can use sometimes but the proper gospel because this might actually cost her her life so she needs to understand what she's deciding to do give her the gospel so they gave her the gospel and she's saying give me jesus so i said to them give it to her again give it to her again explain the cost what she has to let go of you know and um they did and she's like give me jesus so we just stood there and prayed with her and after we'd prayed with her, it was, such a, it was such a powerful, moving moment. Just, it was extraordinary. And I remember saying to her, I think we should burn your shrine. I think we should set fire to all of your witchcraft paraphernalia and burn your shrine. At which point she jumps up and down with joy and runs away. I'm like, where has she gone? And she comes back with this jerry can of like paraffin or something. And she gathers all of her stuff together and she poured it all out. And then she struck a match and the whole thing goes up. And the team turn and they're like, what do we do now? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like I've never done this before. So There's a book clue. somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> so I said, I think we worship. So we worshipped in like traditional, you know, song, which obviously we knew a few of, and we danced together around this burning pile of witchcraft stuff and the whole village, I mean, it wasn't a massive village, like 15 people, but they'd all come out because this was quite a sight. And then she says, they all need to get saved too. And I'm like, well, it doesn't quite, you can't tell them that, it doesn't quite work like that, but we'll give them the gospel. So we gave them the gospel and the whole village by one man gave their life to Jesus. And then I said to the team, you know, I, I'm not sure we're ever going to find this village again. So we better make sure they're filled with the Holy Spirit and baptized in water before we leave. So we prayed for more to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, they were. And then they had one jerry can of water. And it's precious. So mm -hmm. we got little cups and we baptized each one of them. And I've got, I, I got my iPhone out. I thought, I'm going to video this. So I'll, I'm probably never going to believe it actually happened. So I got my iPhone out and I... <laughs> I videoed one of my our interns baptizing the witch doctor and then baptizing I mean it's just extraordinary and then her I've got a video of her dancing singing about Jesus afterwards and it just makes me weep when I look at it and then we left and from the moment we walked in to the moment that we left and all of that happened was just two hours but this is the most extraordinary thing about that story as we were as we were driving home I, I, I was just like I feel like I'm in a dream like, I feel like I'm living in a dream. This is the sort of thing you read about in books. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Not the sort of thing they experience. I feel like I'm in a dream and I can't understand it. And so I thought, well, I'm going to do something to mark the occasion. And the Ugandans love pork. 
So I said, hey guys, let's stop at a pork joint, which is like a little shack where they, you know, you just chop up a pig and cook it, it's delicious, and get some pork and a soda. And the, the intern, <laughs> Ugandan intern, who'd led the witch doctor to Jesus and prayed for her to be filled with the Holy Spirit and baptised in water, he says, oh, I can't eat pork. And I'm like, oh, okay, thinking he doesn't like it. That's all right, we'll get some soda and chapati. And then a little bit later, he says, Nicola, Nicola, um, what direction are we driving in? Which way is Mecca? Yeah. So I suddenly thought, oh, so I turned around and I said, um, Faizo, are you a Muslim? And he was like, yes. Is this a problem? And I'm like, oh my goodness. Oh my That's goodness. incredible. Yeah. So I had two thoughts. Like, number one, how on earth did that not get picked up in our recruitment process that so he's actually a Muslim, has never met Jesus? And secondly, how extraordinary. I mean, how extraordinary that God could use a young Muslim man wow. to lead a queen ranking witch doctor to Jesus. And I just thought, Lord, you are so outside of any box I have ever put you in. And it just undid me. And I, so I said to Faizo, it's not a problem, but maybe we should have a bit of a chat. <laughs> so later on in the week, late, you know, a few days later, the, one of my team sat with him and led him to Jesus and he got baptised in the slum with some slum dwellers a few weeks later and it was beautiful but it just blew my mind wow I'm like God you can do anything you'll use anyone that is incredible isn't it I went back to see that lady a month later because I wanted to make sure she was okay and um, because I knew it was really dangerous what she did because they, they you know it was just big and and I was sat with her on a little bench in her village and I had a question it was really burning in my heart. And I said to her, what, what was it that day? Mm -hmm. Like we just walked in the village and you just fell on your knees. You know, what was it that day that made you decide you wanted Jesus? And she said this statement that was so profound to me. I wrote it down. And she said, the moment that you walked into my village, I saw that the power that was inside of you was far greater than the power that was inside of me. And I knew in that moment I had to bow the knee to it. Wow. I know I'm like, only Jesus. I'm getting tingly. Only Jesus. I mean, only Jesus. We walked in there with nothing except Jesus. And how long were you out in Uganda for? We lived there for six years. And this was the tapestry of your experience for six years, this sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, we had many, many more normal days than that. And, you know, I say to people all the time, we pray for many, many sick people to be healed and saw far more die than we did get healed. That's the reality of it. Um, we buried many more people mm. than we wanted to. And, you know, there were days when you felt like you were losing on every, on every front. Um, but we also saw through death, actually God do some beautiful things and there's something incredibly precious about journeying those moments with people mm -hmm. um, and seeing the presence of Jesus in those moments with people and so we did see we did see the miracles mm -hmm. and that but mm -hmm. we also saw a lot of suffering mm -hmm. and we saw a lot of sickness and we saw a lot of death mm -hmm. um, and we still do and as I said, we ha I don't think we ever tip the balance of seeing more miracles than we did not. Right. But we still pray every time regardless. And um, yeah. So how did you feel then? How did you, how did you feel and how did you know that the six years were coming up and you're going to be asked to come back to the UK? When my husband was very sick, as I said earlier, back in 2012-13, um, he, he was very sick. He had seven surgeries in seven months. Three were life-saving, two done in Africa. Wow. Um, and he was, in, he was in a very bad way. And I'd flown actually back to Uganda to pack up some stuff and had been told that um, he needed to have a, a surgery in London. And the surgeon had said to me, if we operate now, he's too sick, he'll die. But if we don't operate in the next couple of weeks, he's going to die anyway. So we're going to try and get him as stable as we can. So go to Africa quickly pack up your stuff set somebody else to you know oversee it he's going to have a long recovery and so I jumped on a plane with my son who was 14 and um but anyway a couple of days after I got there Simon took a major downturn and I got a phone call to say he he's probably 
he's dying, he might not make it through, we're going into surgery now, we've got no choice. So I rushed to the airport, jumped on a plane with my son and, and went straight to the hospital. Of course, he had survived, but I knew that he was going to be unconscious for a while. And so I got on a tube and I went to London. There's an amazing place in London, a church there who do missionary car loans. And I thought, I need a car. I needed to, I needed to occupy myself, to be mm. honest. I thought, I'll go get a car from this place. And so I rang them and said, I'm coming. They were just brilliant. As I walked out of the tube station... I looked out and I saw this big old derelict building and thought I don't remember that building being there and uh, and I looked at the top to see what it was and it had a sign on it and it said Every Life Mission London and I was like somebody else has got a mission called Every Life in London I don't understand that's weird and in the slums we wear if you've ever seen any of our photographs we wear t-shirts with our name on and it's for security so we don't get mugged basically people know we're there to help out and i saw people coming out of this building wearing our t-shirts like i see you yeah. and i watched one go down an alley and there was a guy with a needle in his arm and, and he helped the guy and he picked the guy up and put him on his shoulder and carried him and laid him down and i poked my head inside the building and poked his laid him down on a hospital bed and then I saw them going down another alley and there were some women who were selling their bodies and they encouraged them to come in and have a cup of tea and and I stood there thinking I'm really confused and then all of a sudden it was raining and I was looked again and that building wasn't there what? and I'm like I think I just had a vision and at the point in time I was really irritated wow and I just remember saying, Jesus, I don't know what you're doing, but I don't care about the future of the mission at this point mm, in time. That's, mm. not my, that's not my biggest question in life. My question is, is my husband going to live or die? But it was so, I mean, I'd never had a vision like that where I could, I could see it like I see you with my eyes open. And, um, but I wrote it down. And six months later, when Simon was recovered, I shared it with him and he said, well, it looks like we're starting a mission in London then. And um, there's obviously something for, God in, for us to do in the UK. And so, but we were heading back to Africa. He was well, we were going home. But that began the journey really of thinking, this is bigger than just Africa. We're mm -hmm. supposed to be in other places. And the Lord began to talk to us about establishing a missions base in London. So um, it took probably about a year and a half of thinking and praying and all sorts of other conversations and things for us to then decide that it was time for us to set in a, a leader. We actually, at that point, were just in Uganda. So we set a, a director in for Uganda and we, we relocated back to the UK. And um, we were going to pi help Pioneer London set up an international mm -hmm. office because at, the, at that point in time, the charity was being run out of Simon's parents' front room and then um i would i would fly in and out of africa so that was kind of the process of bringing us back really was just this vision from the lord so you've got this charity now every life and yeah please do check it out they've got a great website and so forth and uh, you haven't asked me to to say this but if there's any help you can offer i guess in particular money and donations yeah. <laughs> and so forth if you're if you're willing to donate to the charity i'm sure nicola and everyone you know would just be so so welcome so so if you feel that way inclined uh, please, please do. We've got this charity now, mm -hmm. um, and you're the founder of it, and yeah. so forth. And so, so, so that is is that's where we are now in terms yeah. of you run that charity. And yeah. do you still go backwards and forwards to Uganda a lot? Or? Yeah. So up until COVID, mm -hmm. um, I was in Africa every three months for about two to three weeks. Wow. Yeah. As we, because we've been growing obviously, and then we've started Kenya and we're, we're starting Rwanda, and so my job is really to to help grow our leaders, encourage our leaders and oversee that all and so yeah i'm back and forth a lot look at this has been one of the most incredible interviews thank you so much oh, thank you i really really have enjoyed it and it's it feels like it's it's precious it's eternal it's well i say precious i feel like i'm saying your story is priceless and again i've said it before but i want to say it again i hope it touches the lives of countless mm. people um, and inspires God, you know, in people and people to do who knows what. Yeah. Who knows what. And and if it has, um, at the comments at the bottom of um, Nicola's interview, state how it's inspired you. Uh, get in contact with, with Nicola in, in, in weeks, months and years to come and tell her, you know, what, what this interview meant to you and what it's inspired you to do and possibly to lay down and take up. That would just be the most incredible thing. It really, really would. Would you mind praying us out? Sure. Thank you. 
Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this time to talk. We thank you, Lord, that you are working in each one of our lives in different and unique ways. And we just want to tell you again, Jesus, that we love you. You are our everything and it is our joy and it is our privilege to serve you with our lives. And I just pray for myself and, and for anyone who is watching, Lord, I pray that that you would continue to reveal more of your plans and your purposes for each one of us and that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us to be bold and courageous and to follow you where you lead. Amen.